So anyway, feedback is always appreciated. It is one of the core agile values is the feedback's important. Um, so please use your app and rate the session. Um, just, you know, I think it's already been announced that one of the things in the top corner says I'm really old. Uh, that part's true. Um, I was at a conference you know, a few weeks ago with Ron Jeffries, and Ron Jeffries has actually been programming longer than I have. In fact, he started writing code before Martin Fowler was born. So, talking about really old code. Uh, kind of the interesting thing is actually in the bottom, uh, bottom right, where it talks about technologies. Uh, I tend to be one of the early adopters of new technology. I don't come up with this stuff, but when something new comes along, it's hard for me to resist kind of playing with it. And so I, I've kind of done that through my entire career. But a side effect, that means some of the things I'm talking about today may not be appropriate for you today. But chances are, over the next five years, this is something you'll see quite a bit of. So if it doesn't feel like quite right for you, still take some notes, because this may become interesting later on. So why do you want to do managerless processes? Um, so let's sort of start with why, why you'd ever want to go to this way, especially if you happen to be a manager right now. Um, I think for the developers in the audience, we, we could go there immediately. Part of the things is, that, is the uncertainty associated with the requirements sort of drives a little bit of this. So going back to the early days of Agile, when I was still playing with the early days of Agile, I kind of had this model in my head, and I talked about this with my clients, this, this kind of certainty around requirements and this uncertainty around requirements. And it's kind of a broad, broad range. You're somewhere in the middle there in most cases. And it turns out, you know, my spiel about Agile was, you know, waterfall, frankly, worked. Right? I mean, I built a lot of systems using waterfall processes. We deliver on time. But generally, he had a certainty of requirements. You knew what you were trying to build, and therefore, you could put a plan together and make it executed. That when it became a little less certain, when you're sort of a little, a little less, less concerned about what's going on, not quite sure what's happening, you may be changing your mind a little bit, that's where Agile really became a sweet spot. And, and for a lot of my clients back then, you know, you're, they were kind of in that not quite sure what I want to build stage. They may say they knew they did, but you can look at them and say, you were really not quite sure. But there was this whole thing that says, if you don't know what you want to build, I'm sorry, Agile doesn't work, Waterfall, nothing works. You're kind of in the sort of the graveyard of projects. If you try to do this project not knowing what you want, you're just basically spending money for no, no benefit. And again, this is my model about the, you know, the Y2K time frame. Well, you know, more recently, uh, you know, I've been playing in this sort of the graveyard and, and building applications in this graveyard zone. Uh, and it sort of comes from this recognition, this concept of there's a set of what I call fuzzy problems. And a lot of this comes from the uh, you know, wonderful model from Dave Snowden, the, I have to always look at the pronunciation, Gnevin model. This is a Welch word. Um, and one of the things that Dave Snowden did was he classified problems based upon sort of their key traits and how they kind of behave. And simple problems where the cause-effect relationship is very straightforward. Uh, so this is pretty easy to wrestle with these sort of problems because it's very straightforward. The concept of best practice exists in this zone. And then there's these complicated problems where the cause effect relationship is, is more convoluted, which sort of says, yeah, yeah, yeah there is a cause effect relationship, but it's kind of only a few of us really understand what it is. It's sort of the domain expert, so to speak. Uh, but it does exist. But then he doesn't stop there. Dave says there's also these other problems that he calls complex and chaotic. Now, a complex problem is where the cause effect relationship does not exist. It turns out, yes, if this happens, you can probably figure out why this particular event happened by chasing back the, the causal effects, but it doesn't predict the future. And there's a whole interesting set of problems with these, ones I call fuzzy. This is like, should I loan you money? I don't know the absolute answer to that question. I don't know if you're going to pay it back. It's a fuzzy question. Google AdWords, all the marketplace sort of stuff is, is sort of fuzzy. Certainly all the financial models, the, market, market, the markets like that are, are completely fuzzy. You don't know this is going to happen. And whereas you have best practice down and simple, and you sort of have good practice and complicated, because there is more than one way to skin the cat, in complex, it's, there, there is no good answer. In fact, an answer that works today and tomorrow fails the third day. And you sort of have to walk away from it. And that's a very strange sort of phenomenon. The other thing Dave Snowden will tell us is that you, most of the time you're in a state of disorder, which means you're not really sure where your problem fits. And this is, this is the thing that he does now as a consultant, is help understand that. But he says about 85% of the problems he runs across are in disorder. 
the company doesn't really know where it fits. And you have to sort of watch it, see how it behaves, see how it acts, to sort of figure out what sort of segment it lies in. And he also says, there's a warning here, uh, as individuals, we tend to have prejudices about where we want things to be. Uh, sometimes, you know, it, you want it to be complicated because I'm an expert. And I get paid really well to be an expert. So it doesn't matter what problem it is, I'm an expert. Even though it may be a complex problem, which expertise doesn't exist, yet you'll claim you're an expert. And so you sort of drag it over there. Certainly if you're a politician, uh, you're thinking there's some, oh, every problem is kind of simple. Uh, all I have to do is build a wall, or I do something else, and all of a sudden, uh, all, the, all these complex problems fall away. And of course, you know, a simple solution like that doesn't really solve complex problems. Now, it turns out also that you tend to organize yourself differently for each one of these problem segments. And this is sort of the key. That for a simple problem, it turns out there are best practices. And so you can hire a bunch of people, and the job of the manager is very clear. Teach them how to do it well. Teach them how to do it faster and faster, because there is a best practice. When you get into the complicated world, you have these experts. They know how to do it. But they're experts. They're very expensive. And so to properly leverage them, we want to make sure we put a team in place to do what they tell us to do. And so you put a, a manager in place and employees to do this work. And you carve yourself up into stories. You create backlogs. And you do all the, all the right things to sort of drive this engine and get it to work very effectively. When we move over to the complex segment, where there is no cause-effect relationship, there really are no experts. And so there's not a role for the expert in this space. In fact, if you try to use that sort of complicated structure here, this structure, in solving a complex problem, the first thing you're going to do is figure out your expert's not an expert. Your reaction is going to be, you fire him. And you hire another expert. But of course, he's equally ignorant. So it turns out, of course, we have, we have a little uh, story we like to tell about these experts. They say, what's the difference between these experts and used car salesmen? And the answer is, used car salesmen know they're lying. <laughs> so eventually, you get tired of firing the experts, you fire the manager and hire another one, because clearly he can't get the work done. And of course, you're fated to fail in this sort of structure, solving a complex problem. So instead, when you organize a complex problem, you organize yourself along people that are going to try things out knowing that things will fail, and they'll try something else. In other words, they almost have no memory of this. They're almost like you know, baseball players going after the plate, knowing that 70% of the time, they are going to fail. And if they can succeed 30% of the time, they're worth $20 million a year for having just such a low success rate. And so you have to have people who have no memory. Because fundamentally, there's no room for an expert. There's no role for the manager. What's the manager going to tell you to do? There's no backlog associated with this. And so you want to organize yourself differently for this. And so it's a managerless process because the problem doesn't really allow that complicated structure to work well. So that's what motivates it. So, so, so now my model sort of says, instead of having a graveyard here, this is kind of the domain of the fuzzy problems. But it turns out they're viable problems. These are problems we are starting to solve. And fortunately, I've been, had a chance in my last decade of my career to go play with almost exclusively fuzzy problems. And that allows me to use more new technologies, new languages, new processes. And I want to share some of those processes with you. Now, the key thing, one of the key things that's driving this, as you see a lot of visibility around, is we're moving to what I call the age of agents. It's all about things, you know, programs running on your behalf out there, sort of making, helping sort of collect information and making suggestions to you. They don't really know that you should get, a, get up right now and, and go drive the car to this location. They don't really know that. They don't really know what your the next meal should be. But they have some ideas about that. It's a fuzzy problem. And you're seeing that you know, you know, hit us wholeheartedly. There's just a lot of assistive technologies out there of how to do things better. You're seeing all these clever front ends that are voice driven. And it turns out the voice driven part is not the interesting part of the problem. I was fortunate enough to hear the guy that founded Siri before Apple bought them talk about this whole process. He said the innovation he had was getting these various services, these back end services, to interact with each other figuring out how to make these things interact. The voice front end was just kind of icing on the cake. But that's the real innovation occurring this. And of course, this is all fuzzy. You know, we're making suggestions to you. This is the world of where we're going in. This is where the real money is being made in solving these fuzzy problems. And again, organizing yourself as a complicated doesn't get that accomplished. Uh, I do go to a lot of conferences. Uh, you listen to all the hot topics out there. There's lots of technology stuff out there. I, I talk about microservices. Of course, the container world is going crazy, have their own conferences. 
and this does a lot of this stuff. But it's not just technology out there. There's a lot of process stuff. Obviously, Agile's been introduced now for over well, 15, 20 years. Uh, you know, now, uh, Eric Meyer's talking about one hacker away. Uh, other sort of very advanced processes to allow you to, to work differently. There's all these sort of the business guys getting into it as well. They have lean startups and MVPs. Uh, we have these new sort of focused titles. You know, full stack developer becomes something more in vogue. Uh, the DevOps community has their own conferences. And there's an underlying theme to all this. It says, we're trying to solve fuzzy problems. And competitive advantage for fuzzy problems comes when I can go fast, when I can try an idea out aggressively. So that's why it's important to de DevOps. I gotta deploy this code quickly. I can't sort of stack up ideas for three months and ship it. I'll get killed by the guy who's shipping it every day. And so you move into this mode. So it's about going faster. So if you look at sort of the XP values, you know, whether you're working in fuzzy or agile processes, you know, I kind of believe in all of these. These are sort of the cornerstones of, of building successful teams and, and the morale associated with that. And I kind of agree with what Kent Beck said many years ago. It says, you, you get these things right and it's fun. It's fun to come to work. And that's the reason that I think he pushed really hard for this, this creates this fun environment. So we agreed to all those things. So you look at sort of, you know, solving the agile stuff and we came up with a whole set of practices associated with that. Came up with a whole set of roles associated with trying to focus on that. But when you get to fuzzy problems, all of a sudden, and you, you, work, you wanna work differently than this. And so when you start getting into fuzzy, all of a sudden, these are not best practices. These are things you tend to get rid of. And as well as that, you start killing the roles off. And you get down to something that's almost very simplistic, but it's designed to go really fast. So let's look at a couple of case studies where I've actually done this. This is actually from 2006, so this is, you know, you know, 11, 12 years old at this point. Uh, a, a work I did in London uh, when I was working for ThoughtWorks. And this is sort of the, uh, you know, we had a team, you know, down the side you see the names of the team. Matt was our customer. And these were the various participants. I, I am not Fred and George, there's a different George. That's not me twice. Um, and it's sort of the traditional titles. And for the client we gave ourselves titles because that's what he's looking for. In fact, we were, even ThoughtWorks assigned us these titles. They was the officially the project manager, George was the guy who had great Ruby knowledge because it was a Ruby project and I had never done Ruby before. Uh, so he was kind of the tech lead and he brought all the developers. And of course, George was gonna write code as well because George likes writing code. So those were kind of our official roles and we had a business analyst. So again, very traditional agile sort of structure. But how do we actually work? Because it turns out we we're working in a fuzzy problem. So it turns out, you know, Dave, the manager, official manager, he also wrote our acceptance test for us. He understood the big system and he said, I can, I can do this for us. In fact, he actually ran the build process as well. And of course, Matt, the customer says, oh, well, I can look at the code and make decisions as well on the, on the fly as you guys are continually developing this stuff. So we picked up that role. Uh, it turns out, of course, on any project I'm working on, I'm gonna be the manager anyway. Um, and the client sort of treated me that way, so you're sort of assuming those sorts of roles. Um, I have a lot of architectural experience, um, even compared to, to George. So I almost, you know, was again playing a tech lead role about overall architecture goals. Uh, Paul was actually a brilliant guy in terms of bringing new technology and making good use of it. And so, you know, we three kind of played tech lead roles and, and sort of traditional tech lead thing. Uh, I actually have a UI design background as well, so I did that along with the customer. We, did, we designed all the screens. Um, and it turns out we also turned out ourselves that we were doing the analysis. Once we understood what problem we we're trying to solve, we were becoming great analysts. And so we sat there and did that. And of course, Matt, the customer, caught on to how to write stories very quickly himself. And so upon realizing that, and we realized that almost the first week, you know, Jeremy rolls himself off the project. We don't need him. So you look at how we were actually acting, and it's like they're, they're almost you know, a bunch of full stack developers, undifferentiated roles. We do what we need to do to get the job done. And this again is you know, a dozen years old. Now the other things we did, it, it sort of, again, to complement the fuzzy process, is basically we're a fixed price project. Uh, I have to love fixed price projects because in a fixed price project, I get to control the process. I get to control the resource. I don't have to sort of justify myself to, to a client who has no knowledge of how Agile actually works. So I like that idea. But we also co the team. We all sat around the same table, you know, including Matt, the customer. Uh, our iteration length was usually daily because we were, again, having a stand-up that talked about what we need to work on today. Because things are coming out really fast. 
We're not talking about one week, two weeks sort of stuff. We're talking about what did you get done yesterday? What can we do today? Some of the same focus that Dan, Dan North talked about this morning very eloquently. And basically, we took the original backlog they had, and they had a backlog, and we threw it away. It's like, what do we need to worry about today? And it, and it turns out Matt was changing his mind as he saw the product evolve. And so that backlog, you know, these kind of stories we had written up on cards, we kind of went through all those away. And the final thing is we wind up over-delivering. We deliver 20% more than the client expected on time, just by turning us loose and just solve the problem. So this is, again, in, in an environment where we're basically in a managerless environment. We're kind of working to solve the problem. Now, what are the inhibitors to getting to a managerless process? Because probably you're sitting in a complicated organization, one that has a specialist, one that has a manager, one that has the employees. And so what do you have to do to fix this? And I've had some occasions to have to wrestle with this myself. And the first thing I have to realize is we're over-specialized. Uh, to some degree, having the concept of your job is to do your front-end programming, you're as the back-end, you're the database person, and thou shall not cross these boundaries. Not without lots of paper, not without processes, not without meetings. This incredibly slows you down, and speed is what you want for fuzzy problems. The theory, of course, is specialists are more productive, so let's make sure they're productive. And again, I like Dan North's definition of productive this morning. It means generating a lot of stuff, not necessarily being effective. Of course, in practice, the overhead of communication is completely underestimated. I mean, these steps are taking the step to the next process and how much paper it takes and meetings. And of course, you create these imbalances. Well, I've got enough iOS programmers. Who has too many iOS programmers? I ne never met that team. Um, but you always create these imbalances because of these specializations. And of course, if you're a specialist and you're not busy right now, you kind of got to look busy. And so you sort of create you know, arbitrarily useless sort of work, like backlogs. So what do these agile roles happen? These agile roles tend to evaporate when you start to solve these problems this way. Now, and I've frankly been you know, pushing away these agile roles for almost over a decade now. So I like this pyramid because it talks about there's kind of three types of roles overall. And I sort of put the titles within each of these roles. So management is like project managers and iteration managers. Uh, business guys, I, I put the customer BA and QA here. QA because QA is always testing at the business level. They're doing acceptance testing. Unit testing, that's part of development. And there's lots of titles for developers. There are architects. There's you know, you know, front end, back end, all these other things, DBAs. I kind of loop all of those in the developer because we got, we got kind of homogeneous in that pretty quickly. All right, so let's talk about the fates of these roles as you sort of get into these fuzzy problems. Um, well, first of all, you sort of look at QA. And you think about QA, it's, it's kind of interesting because QA, when I started writing code, was the guys you couldn't teach to write code. There are guys that can't write code, so you make them QA. And they sit there and they try things on their machine, or punch cards back in the day. Uh, but now, of course, all the QA tools are programming tools. You got Selenium, you got Cucumbers, you got other tools. Uh, they're all very much programming tools. Interesting. You have to be a programmer and actually be a, that. And by the way, you can write really bad Selenium code, you write good Selenium code. i much rather have good Selenium code. And of course, these architectures that these systems we're building are really complex. To be right acceptance tests against these, you really understand the architecture. This is not the QA skill of yesteryear. This is different. So let's say you have to write code and you have to understand architecture. Gee, it sounds like a programmer. And of course, now we're moving to the idea we don't run an acceptance test anymore. Uh, we actually want our systems to have active monitoring in it. It's the same sort of think thought process, but I, my systems are active now. They're, they're running all the time. They're talking to external services. And one of the things they need to do is pull these external services and see what the result is. But when this external service goes down and you haven't got active monitoring, you don't know about this until somebody calls you up. Says, oh, by the way, I can't log in anymore. You've got to instrument your system so it finds that problem quicker. So if you've got to instrument a system, use that instead of acceptance testing, deployed to the live environment. Again, time to market. All right, so that QA goes away based on that. All right, so let's get the next one, business analysts. Uh, here's your business analyst. His job is to tell the programmers what to do because we're stupid. And when we ask him a question, he'll answer it for us. Of course, what's really going on is, of course, he doesn't really know either until he talks to the customer. And when I ask him a question, he goes and runs to the ask customer and tells me the answer. So I'm saying, okay, why are you sitting in the middle here, dude? What, what is your role here? You're not the domain expert. You're just kind of a mouthpiece. 
Well, he says, you know, well, if this world is too complicated for you to understand. You're just a programmer. I'm like, dude, you want to try future? <laughs> really? You think your world is more complicated than my world? There are only a few domains where that's actually true. Uh, by the way, one of them is like particle physics, you know, and string theory and all that stuff. We can't get our heads around that because only those weird physicists can do that. So what do we do in that case? We teach them to write code. That's the only way to solve the problem. So it's not too complicated for us. Trust us. We can understand your problem to me. Well, we can't talk. Yeah, well, some of that's true. Um, <laughs> but we can sort of get over that. I mean, frankly, things like uh, you know, the Big Bang Theory have convinced the world that, yeah, we are human beings at some level. Um, and we can be communicated with at some level. It's just they understand it's a different sort of language. Uh, we like social skills, yeah, so. Uh, you know, we, we dress funny, fine. But it really, at the end of the day, I don't really need this guy. I really want to talk to the customer directly, particularly for the fuzzy problem. Because one of the things about a fuzzy problem is I need to understand the problem in order to try solutions out. Again, we can't have a backlog, can't have stories, because we don't know what the answer is. So he's gone. All right, so we're down, we're doing nicely here. Uh, iteration Manager. Um, the history of Iteration Manager is a made-up title that, frankly, ThoughtWorks made up in back in the day. Uh, it was one of the very, very early Agile projects. Uh, ThoughtWorks came in and said, we need a project manager on the team as part of our, you know, our, our people. And the, the company said, I don't want to pay for a project manager. I got my own. We use my project manager. ThoughtWorks said, he's not really a project manager. He's an iteration manager. What he's really going to do is you know, manage the iterations, which you don't understand. Oh, OK, that's fine. Of course, it's a lie. He's really <laughs> and there's nothing in you know, Kent Beck's original book talking about I need a project manager. He calls him a clerk. That's a better title. So we get rid of that guy because he's not necessary. All right, so we're down to project managers. What are their role in this world? Well, if you sort of look at the individual roles of what they're trying to do, they do a lots of things. And in fact, you're expected to do a lots of things if they do their job well. First of all, they are the clerk. And thank God we have somebody to do that for us because we don't want to keep track of that ourselves. Um, it's not a lot of burden associated with tracking a story. I'm sorry, it's not a lot to that. Uh, leaders. It's very important to have leaders in organizations. But sort of anointing somebody to be the leader is not necessarily a formula for success. That doesn't, he may not be the person that's respected. He may think he needs to make decisions that he's not qualified to make. So teams are much better off by choosing their own leaders. We'll get more into that. He is the guy that talks to the outside world. So he kind of is an ambassador at that level. He's talking to the outside world, coordinating the schedules, the teams, you know, dependencies, and all these sorts of things. He plays that role. He's also supposed to be the coach and mentor for the team. He's supposed to sort of give you career advice. Of course, he became a manager. So the type of advice he tends to give you is, you need to become a manager at some point to be brilliant like me. Um, not necessarily your best coach and mentor, if that's actually not your inclination. He's also the concierge. He's the guy that's supposed to be working for the team, doing things the team needs to have done, the things that you know, otherwise don't get happen. And occasionally he turns into some power-hungry boss you know, who says, I, I, am, I am the god here. I can get to tell you what to do. And some guys get off on that. Not the good ones. That's why it's in red. But some of them get off on that. Now, going out and trying to find the best person for an organization that has all these traits is doomed to failure. And so you want to recognize these are not necessarily, these are things managers are supposed to do, but these are basically roles. And they're roles that necessarily, you don't necessarily have to have the manager do or have a manager be in place to handle. So you, you want to sort of begin to etch away of these things, get rid of these things, and sort of disperse these roles into the rest of the team. And that's kind of moving how you need to move to this. So basically after this, now you're left with basically the two roles I talked about. You got customers, you got developers. The relationship is customer, tell me about your domain, teach me your domain. And then, hey, it's, a, it's about ideas. I do algorithms. That's why I'm a programmer. I have ideas. I'm going to try all sorts of amazing things. When I've done this in practice, uh, and I've done this again for the last 10 years in various organizations, uh, it turns out you know, the customer coming one day says, wow, we made some more money yesterday. What did you guys do? Oh, we came up, we tried this, and it worked. How did you think of that? Dude, we're just, we're just programming. We try things. Very powerful. So that's kind of how you get rid of those roles as sort of doing that. So if you want to move to that creating the manager's process, the first thing you need to do is begin to trust the organization. You have to trust, which means basically put yourself out there on a limb, 
trust that it's going to happen. First thing you want to trust is that the programmers care. One of the things I say is my programmers don't care about stuff. They just come in to kind of collect a check. Probably if you create one of these unfun environments, that's exactly what they're doing. You want to make it fun. Trust that they will care. Treat them that way. Trust that leaders will emerge. I believe in situational leadership. I believe that these things will happen. Uh, as, as social beings, we tend to want to have leaders. And because we want to have leaders, we will tend to anoint our leaders as necessary. And in fact, if we, if we can't figure out how to anoint, we will sort of act very dysfunctional in that way. It would be very obvious it's happening. But you want these leaders to emerge. So trust it will happen. Short of being a sociopath, we like doing this. Problems will arise and will get solved. You don't need to be jumping in there saying, oh my god, we may have a problem, and oh my god, we, we may never solve it. Trust that it will be solved. These are bright people, they're motivated, they care, they have leaders, they will solve these problems. Trust that it will happen. And finally, you should believe that the team will be constantly changing its structure. And you want to not only probably support that, you want to even encourage it. Because as you move, or project moves through its various phases, the needs for that project are going to change. And one of the side effects of that means is you have the wrong people in the room. I don't need that database wizard anymore. We got that. We don't, we don't need the architect. We're way into the process. The architecture has been well established. The roles look really good. Everything's working really fine. I don't need that architect anymore. In fact, he doesn't really that write that good a code. You know, he's an architect. So, you know, don't need him anymore. The team should be constantly morphing. My very first ThoughtWorks project, going back to 2004, uh, I had a team that was given to me by ThoughtWorks. I made 10 staff changes in the first six weeks of that project, including kicking client programmers out of the room. I was tuning the team to the team that I needed to get the job done. It's a constant thing. It's one of the things we used to focus on in iterations. Every iteration, you know, yes, have the stand up, yes, or have the retrospective, it's very good, talk about the process changes, talk about how much you got done in the showcase, and evaluate the team and see if I have the right people in the room and morph it. So trust. You want to have a delivery focus. You want to make sure it, the whole organization is around delivering the software. So you want to think that everybody in the room, everybody in the organization is supporting delivery. I had the opportunity to uh, visit uh, the McLaren Racing Team uh, Center outside side of uh, uh, London when I lived there. One of the things that was very obvious in that entire organization, they talked about it, everybody from you know, the executive all the way through the secretary knew exactly what the timings were of the last Formula One race. And everybody in the organization was focused on how do I get that time down? It was a universal focus. When I worked at IBM, and I worked at IBM my first 17 years, and I went through one of the early downsizing. And one of the themes behind the early downsizing says, you're either building product, you're selling product, or you're supporting product. If you're not doing one of those three things, you don't have a job anymore. You want that your organization to have that same philosophy. You're either writing code, you're figuring out what the code needs to be, you're servicing that code, you're deploying that code, whatever it is, it's all about the code. So how are you making delivery go faster? How are you making delivery go faster? So all the roles gotta support that. Focus on the cycle time. How long did it take to get the, how, many, how often are you doing builds? How often can you get doing builds? Can you do builds faster? When I worked in, uh, in London, again, a different company, we got our point that we could push new code of production every three and a half minutes. We didn't start there, we were pushing twice a day. And it was like, we well, do twice a day, you can do three times a day, right? Sure, we tweak this, we can do faster. We kept going faster and faster and faster. It was very much that Formula One focus again. And it focuses on doing the right thing. By the way, we had 50 employees that year, we made 50 million pounds by going faster. This is the way to do it. And you've got to have the guys at the top who believe this is the way to run. That it is all about the organ, it's all about getting the code out the door. And the, even to the top executives got to understand that. Because once they change their mind about that, oh, we can't make a mistake, almost all the waterfall processes will creep back in. Because that's what it's designed to do, make sure I can't make a mistake. If you want to go faster, you've got to have that different focus. I will say that that's one of the nice things about some of the organizations I worked in, they understood going faster. Was the, was the key thing. We would make mistakes in these companies. I remember quite a few mistakes we made. 
and the customer would come to us and say, you guys made a mistake. We said, yep, we, we tried it. We tried something that didn't work. And we wasted you know, $300 of your money. Well, you know, can't waste $300. We need to have some more meetings about that. My job was to tell him to shut up. And I would tell him that. If he didn't like my answer, if we could see the managing director, he would tell them to shut up. We're not going to slow down because we made mistakes. Instead, we will go faster. We need to believe in the feedback. So we got to force it at the top. From a management perspective, we're trying to do management inversion. And management inversion is kind of the idea that the manager works for the team. Again, the power-hungry guy never really gets this. Uh, but the really good managers, the good managers you've had in your careers, I'm sure, really felt that they worked for the team. And they would do whatever necessary for the team. So you want to kind of enforce that, make sure that the role doesn't exist otherwise. So wiping out the title of manager and replacing it with some of these other titles becomes a key part of that. So my favorite term for this is sort of a concierge. It's kind of like an ombudsman. But it's kind of a role you put in place and say, well, here's the guy that if a team has a problem, here's the guy you can always go to and make it his problem. It doesn't matter where you, you, know, you need a new LAN adapter, fine. Go to the concierge, you'll go downstairs to the nearest hardware store, pick up a LAN adapter, bring it back to you. Or maybe you need a database expert, you know, go get that guy for you. It's very important that this concierge reacts to the team's needs regardless of how trivial they are. It's his problem, he's a concierge. Again, management inversion focused on. He needs to respect the team's decisions. The team may say, well, here's my leader. You're looking at your concierge saying, well, that's a stupid choice. You can't really say that. You got to say yes, that's fine. You got to live with that. Trust that the team will do it right. Ambassador, who's the guy that's representing the team to the outside world? Again, they'll make choices about who that is. They may rotate it around. Fine, accept their choice. And most important, the membership. One of the most damaging things you can do to a team is when the team is dissatisfied with one of its members, it comes to the concierge and says, oh, by the way, this guy doesn't fit. I mean, he keeps fighting us on this. He won't check in his stuff. He doesn't want to work fast. He wants to, then he's just driving us nuts. We want to get rid of him. Fine, he's off the team. There is no other answer to that thing you know, other than he's off the team. Now it becomes the concierge's problem. Now the concierge is going to decide whether it's a personality conflict, skills mismatch, or I just need to fire the guy. But it's not the team's problem anymore. Same way I can't force a member into the team. I remember sitting in London where I was playing the concierge role, and you know, so, you know, third party, another executive walks in and says, I had this guy, I'd like him to work on, your, work on one of your teams with you. I said, fine, we can bring the guy, team in and ask him to, to say what they think. But I need him to be on that team. I said, yeah, you can ask these guys. Well, who's gonna make the decision? They are. No, no, I need the decision. They're gonna make the decision. I am not making that decision. You can ask me to act as much as you want to, I am just the concierge. Turns out, it was one, actually one of the tricks we learned in the management school, turns out it, it was called power negotiation. Turns out one of the really powerful roles, one of the powerful negotiation techniques is, I'm not allowed to agree with you. I'm walking into a negotiation and I can't say yes. That turns out to be very powerful. So membership, very important to let them control the membership. Now, if you play the concierge role, there are no secrets to what's going on in that team. Dan North talked about the, the T man that was, no, was it guy, boy, boy T? No, what was it, man T? It was T boy. Uh, the guy who sort of goes around and gives away T every day to sort of see what's going on. Uh, fundamentally, the concierge has the same ability to see what's going on in teams. Just by watching their interaction, being around, they be asking silly questions, like, go give me a LAN adapter, the morale of the team is there. So you want somebody who's kind of watching what's going on, knowing that they may need a leader, the, the ambassador is struggling, and may need some coaching about that. The, that concierge is seeing that. And again, he can react in sort of that coaching sort of role. All right. So actually, to put this in action, and I, you know, this is more of a case study of how we did this, um, because the specializations were institutionalized with titles. And that's kind of the most you know, damaging thing I see in organizations. People carry around cards and titles. And of course, in Europe, you have contracts that say, this is my job. Here's a contract laying out what my title is. It's very, very constraining when you want to try to do these changes. And I ran across that when I was working in the Daily Mail in London. So here's a case study from the Daily Mail. So I walked into the organization, there were 50 programmers, or 50 in the IT guys, there were ops guys, some QA guys, some design people. I found 25 plus titles. 
Not that unusual, and that's in my experience either. And I found zero people to understand what a project was. Zero. The poor scrum master was standing at the whiteboard every day trying to you know, get the report from the back end, the front end, the design team to see if we had made project, any progress on this project. And she couldn't. She couldn't figure that out. So what did we do in that case? How's my time? 17, oh, we're in good shape. So um, start creating new titles. And the way I got around the contract was I said, you don't have to take these new titles unless you can work on the new project. New project has the new titles. I got tons of legacy code that's going to be there for decades. If you want to keep your old title, here's your legacy code. Have at it. Your choice. Uh, by the way, I will, I will offer retraining. We had almost 100% participation. Retraining every role into programming. Because I do value a QA guy who thinks about a system and how it might fail. I value him. Let's turn him into a programmer. I love architects. Because architects have conceptual skills. They wouldn't be architects otherwise. Train them to write code again. They are beasts. And managers? Managers are natural leaders. They see you know, human things going on. Teach them to write code. So when these human things happen in the middle of a team, they know how to defuse the situation because they have experience in that. So I love these experiences of other roles you know, going back into programming. So we, told, we gave everybody a chance to go through basically a 40-hour intensive programming course. So we went back and described how we're going to do these titles. So uh, basically, we divide ourselves into uh, you know, various roles and responsibilities. We said you know, we use a three-tier pyramid, not the five levels that, that Dan North talked about. And we decided your title is going to be, if you're, you're competent in one of our technologies, we're going to call you a developer. That's the title. Nothing more fancy, no adjectives, no adjectives needed, just a developer. If you are not competent in one of our key technologies, you're called a graduate developer. Uh, because we like to hire graduates. Now, of course, why would I hire anybody who can't do JavaScript or can't do Java? I'm not sure why I'd hire them in the first place, but it's a nice place for the chart. Senior developer is that kind of the expert, the guy who's really good at this stuff, magical in how he can work. Again, very traditional sort of titles um, that you see in all these hierarchies. And this is where we did something different. We said what we really want to do is we want to create these system developers. These are guys who are competent, not experts, competent in five to seven are key technologies, databases, languages, iOS, Android platforms, uh, et cetera. And we will pay you the same we pay these experts. Because it turns out these, these full stack developers, these system developers, these are the guys that can give a problem to, a fuzzy problem, and say attack it. And they can sort of do a little bit of architecture, they do a little they know how to break it up. This is a, looks like a database problem, this looks like a front end, back end responsibility. And if they need help, they go get the expert. Remember, it's like Dan North described, these experts are floating resources. They go to where the, the worst problems are. They're not permanent team members. It's unnecessary. And we created one more title called Master Developer. And we told everybody, you get to choose. You get to choose which way you want to go in this new model, work on these new projects. Now, this is the Daily Mail. Daily Mail is 125 years old. Literally, in the 1890s, they were buying tabloid news, the same way they do it today. In the 1890s, they were still doing that. It's run by Lord Rothermir, the fourth Lord Rothermir of his title. We're talking about staid, old English organization. So I walk into Human Resources and show them this new chart. What do you think of the reaction I get from Human Resources from a 125-year-old English company? Well, I was expecting a holy war. Instead, they loved it. They have been in so many tangles with programmers saying, oh, yeah, look at this job description. I meet every one of these things. I should be promoted. And they have to go back to the developers and the managers were there, argue about I mean, endless arguments. They never, never finish these arguments. This allows them to get out of the game. Who's judging whether you're competent? The masters, those experts. We're doing it ourselves. It's all in-house. It's just a matter of counting after that. So they loved it. So we fixed the titles. And all of a sudden, a lot of our problems went away. We had, we had hired and fired two CTOs trying to rewrite a system. This team got together and, and finished it early. What else did we do? Well, one of the things was they were sitting in their cubes. And of course, that discourages communication, encourages emails, documents, all sorts of other nonsense. 
So, uh, you know, take a, 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 again a hint out of Kent Beck's first XP book where he says, first thing you do on the first day of a project is you fix the furniture. Uh, this is only a, a picture of when I did this in, when I was working in India, we built our own tables. Now we actually buy them. But, you know, we, we built our own tables. Because it turns out sitting around a table as close as possible is very powerful. So it turns out there's three reasons people talk to each other. First reason is we have the same hobbies. Frankly, as a company, we cannot control that. It means, you know, your kids go to the same daycare, you support the same football team. You know, again, not much control over that. Second reason people talk to each other. They have the same manager. That kind of fixed that problem, but in theory, they have the same manager. They'll talk to each other because they work for the same manager. There's affinity there. Third reason, this guy got tenure at MIT for this. The chance now you and I communicating varies inversely with the square of distances between our chairs. He was a former aerospace engineer. So he's kind of that had a little nature to it. So basically, instead of sitting the whole QA team together over here and sitting the whole development team over here, you're wasting two chits because they work for the same manager and they're sitting close to each other. And they point fingers at each other. So instead, put them around as tight as possible to minimize the square of distances. Put them around the table. Every one of the different roles around the same table. So you fix the furniture, which also means you move the people to that. So we ripped out, in, at Daily Mail, we ripped out all the cubes, put in, literally put in tables, gave them place cubicles and put their stuff into the wall, and that was it. Non-dedicated leadership, I kind of touched on this already. But basically, if you look in you know, books like this, which is, you know, it is sort of a pop, pop uh, anthropology book, but if you look at what point does a village need a dedicated 100% time leader? Not that it gets over 100 people. Yet here's, oh, here's a team, we got eight people, we got to have a manager. There are eight people, oh my God, he can't possibly handle eight people all by himself. Well, these guys did in primitive societies. In fact, most of the time, yes, you're, you are the village, village elder. You're the person that's going to make these decisions when necessary. Otherwise, you're in the field with everybody else. So go back to that 2006 example. Yeah, we were all writing code. Even though we we're playing manager roles, we're still writing code. We're doing other things with our time. We got time to spare. So uh, the ambassador role, I want to call out that a bit more. A very, very important role. Because I don't want to have a guy who feels like he's obliged to go into the negotiation with another team and make a decision on behalf of the team. He's an ambassador. Ambassador represents your interests to the outside group. He's a member of a team. You can rotate him around all you want to. That's fine. In fact, it's a good idea to sort of rotate around and let everybody sort of see what the outside world looks like, see if they're inclined to do that regularly or not. But you're not empowered to commit. Again, that very powerful negotiation technique. You cannot commit on behalf of the team unless the team says you can. So bring back the opinion to the team. We'll make a decision as a team. We'll decide whether we can do this this way or not, or maybe we have some better ideas, send you back. But bring back the ideas from that. But you're just the ambassador. You can't make the decision. So no longer to have that manager who's out there trying to make the decision, feels he's forced to make that decision, comes back, oh, guys, I really tried hard on your behalf, but I had to say, yes, we're going to deliver this in two months instead of six months. We just have to do that. Team morale just goes to hell. They're not motivated. You don't want anybody, you don't want anybody empowered to make that mistake. He's an ambassador. And you know, speaking skills are valuable. That's kind of valuable. We can get over that. But EQ, you know, you know, emotional quotient, sort of understanding related to other people, very, very powerful here. So if you have those EQ skills. Uh, the other thing we got to be careful of is you want to bring work to the team. Once a team figures out how to work well with each other, they've made some decisions. In my you know, years of consulting experience and working with teams and, and writing code myself, I get a new team together, very bright guys. It would take be, be, you know, it takes us anywhere from three to seven weeks before we start producing stuff. And then all of a sudden, you know, our, our, our velocity is enormous. It's, we got a great velocity. But that magic point where we actually start producing, three to seven weeks out. Because we would sit down, we'd decide what tool we like best, or what's our philosophy, our architecture, and we get together and we have to hammer this stuff out again. And then once we establish these sort of ground rules with each other, we're very productive. And then what happens is we get split up and put new teams and we do it again. I mean, you go on short cycle times, you can't do this anymore. When projects are not, no, long, no longer six month long projects or, or longer, you can't afford to pay that penalty for that. So you keep the team together and bring the work to the team. So a team is sitting here where you've already hammered all this stuff out, come to, come to us as an expert. Teach us your domain. Bring some money with you so we can spend it. And we'll try to make things happen. 
and we run out of money or we run out of ideas, go away, we'll bring another guy. Teach us how to do that. So don't create this sort of musical chairs that every time I do this, I bring my spreadsheet out. Oh, I need one senior programmer, one architect, two QAs. Everybody's equal. We put them together, they'll, they'll work. No, they don't. They don't work for the next three to seven weeks. Don't break the team up. Keep them together. They already know how to work together. So we started doing that as well. We brought the work to the teams. All right, I get these questions often, so let me wrap up with talking about appraisal and coaching. Uh, first of all, these are conflicting ideas. Understand appraisals and coaching are conflicting ideas. And the idea that management could do these both for the same team is very, very difficult. At IBM, I had training in how to do this as a manager. Weeks of training associated with how to do this, and regular training, as well as coaching about how to do this job because it's, a, it's normally in a conflict. So the appraisal is about measuring your contribution, however that's measured. You need to be very specific about what that contribution is. But you want to measure that contribution. Um, it does affect promotions. That's why people argue about it. It may affect your salary. And there's going to be a perception of what the employee thinks he did versus what actually the data says the con was accomplished. Coaching is about being honest and giving feedback about what's wrong. So naturally a conflict with that. So how do you do appraisals in a manageless process? Uh, first of all, you gotta define what you count. What are you counting that says you've been successful? Again, productivity, as Dan North was talking about, not necessarily a good thing. Effectiveness is, but how are you gonna measure that? You should measure it very precisely. But you can't break it up by individual, not when the team's really working together. You can't say this guy did this much, this guy did this much. You can't stand from the outside and make those judgments. But you can sort of ask the team to allocate it. What do you, who, was, who was the major contribution to the success we had? The team knows, it knows what it is. They can adjudicate that. If they come back and say everybody is equal, I perfectly have to accept that answer. Trust the team. You will have variations from team to team. Do not try to fight that. Let each team make the decision of how to do that. And certainly encourage experiments. I had one team that said, we're going to do a group appraisal. We're going to go around the room, and everybody's going to, you know, we're going to, you know, Point to somebody and say, okay, tell me something this, tell me about this person's contribution to this project. Everybody around has to say something. One way or the other, you gotta say something. There's no passing. The next person would go through that. The team had enough trust with each other that they could have those frank dialogues. Now we didn't let any manager into that room. Because we wanted to have a frank discussion. But they came back and had good answers. Let them experiment. Coaching, though, in a managerless team is radically different. You basically want to make sure, first of all, you separate the timings. You don't want this to be coincident with the same appraisal timings. You want to make sure in the minds of everybody there, it's two separate processes. To the extent possible, you want to allow, again, the variations of how to do this. And I, one of the things I like is the mentor model. It says, you know, mutually select your mentor who's going to have your coaching relationship. It's got to be mutual. You know, we, I got to want to coach you, you got to want to be coached by me, and we can't change our mind. We gotta make sure we're somehow we don't cap it so not everybody tries to go to the same person and, and basically turn them into the manager. So we need to cap it as necessary. I actually prefer outside mentors, mentors who are outside the team. Because they don't have a vested interest in that, they don't get confused with the contribution stuff. And you really wanna have that sort of firewall that says you're not allowed as a, as a mentor to tell the appraiser anything. It's a private conversation between you. It's like a doctor privilege sort of conversation. Do not break that firewall. Uh, things that you can do to break that very easily, uh, status reports. Uh, you got to be very aware of things. People come and ask you questions as engineers. And as engineers, we want to answer because we're engineers. You got to fight that instinct. What you really want to do is you want to ask them that question. How are you going to use this information? I remember one of my early ThoughtWorks projects was a fixed price project. In other words, we got to cover it no matter how much effort it is. They came, one guy came in and said, you know, you need to tell me who's working in India. I said, how are you gonna use this information? I said, he didn't say, don't know, fine. When you figure that out, come back and see me. His manager comes and sees me. I need to know who's working in India. I say, how are you gonna use this information? Well, when you figure that out, come back and talk to me. Never saw anybody else. Now, if I'd answered that question, they would try to back into my rates. And I'd have another question. Why are your rates so high? Why are your rates too low? Why can't we do with something else? Another set of endless questions. Stop the train here. So when somebody comes and asks you for information like status reports, ask them what they're gonna do with it. 
Where does this go? Who's going to be reading this? Let's see what they say. Sign offs. Evil. That says somebody has permission to say you can do something or not do something. In fuzzy problems, that doesn't work. Uh, one of the things I said when I joined uh, the Daily Mail was, I saw a piece of paper flying across the CTO's desk. It was a sign off sheet. They said, the next time I see one of those ever slide across my desk, I'm going to the shredder. I never saw one. Uh, just try to work with John. Again, somebody comes and says, we can't work with John. He's just impossible to work with. Oh, no, keep trying. I'm sure you can work it out with him. Morale just goes to hell. There was a Harvard Business Review uh, study a few years ago. Harvard Business Review talked about it. What's the damage of one apple in a bunch? One bad apple in a bunch. How much does it spoil? Uh, a study actually measured. It takes down 10 to 12 other people with him. So if John is causing trouble, he's taking 10 to 12 other guys with him. Get him off the team. Then fix the problem. And finally, do not overreact to this. You know, this couple comes, well, if we just had more planning meetings or a better plan, we wouldn't have this issue. We're going to go faster, not slower. So if you get all this stuff right, you wind up having a new, a new way to attack these fuzzy problems. Instead of sort of using stat stories and specialists and all the TDD processes and acceptance tests and migration scripts and all this stuff to build monoliths, which are appropriate for solving complicated problems, Instead, when you're solving fuzzy problems, complex problems, you want to look at idea-focused features. You want to be talking about full-stack developers who can think about the problem and how to solve it overall. You want to build systems that have fast failure built into them so you can try something out aggressively. At Forward, we went from notebooks to production. There was no staging, no testing, no integration servers. Notebook to production. With a million pounds, 50 employees. It was a good answer. Microservices is part of this, very small pieces of work. You can change them very aggressively. Event-based architectures uh, under every definition that Martin gave it this morning. And continuous deployment, not continuous integration, continuous deployment. So that sort of wraps up the story of how you basically want to do a manager's process and why it makes sense for a certain class of problems, but also how you attack the problem, maybe even how you morph your organization to attack it. So I hope you know you got something out of that. I'll be around the rest of the conference. So you know, please let me know. Thank you.